Well, it's obviously a great pleasure to have Kat with us tonight. Uh, Kat is working at uh, the scientific communication team in Cancer Research UK since 2004, right? Yeah, and yeah. until the middle of March. C Cancer Research UK. Cancer Research and uh, she's also a broadcaster, so you might have heard her in the BBC radio scientific shows, such as The Naked Scientist. Uh, she has been named uh, by the BBC America as one of the top ten Brits that make science sexy. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she's very recently, last week, published her book that she wrote tonight about genetics, and so that's what she's going to talk about. She's going to explain how our genes work. In 20 minutes. In 20 minutes. In 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, can everyone hear me? Um, cool, thank you very much for having me. So um, I thought I would do a little reading from the beginning of the book, which explains a bit about uh, the premise behind it, why I wrote it, why it's called Herding Hemingway's Cats, uh, and then I would just randomly burble at you about some stuff for a bit. Um, because it's been a long week and I'm tired. Uh, so, um, so we start. Um, this is from the introduction. It all started with a photo of a cat. I was hiding at the back of a scientific conference at the Royal Society in London when a cuddly-looking cat with unusually big feet caught my eye. This is a Hemingway cat, said the lecturer, pointing at the animal on the large screen behind him. They have six toes, they're polydactyl. Ernest Hemingway was said to be fond of them, and they still live on his estate in Florida today. And here, he pokes at the computer, changing the slide to one covered with photos of misshapen human hands. A polydactyl children with extra digits. It's the same genetic mistake that causes them. Looking at a six-toed cat or a six-fingered human, a natural assumption might be that it's due to a fault in a gene. But it's not. In fact, the fault lies in a control region of DNA that acts as a switch, normally turning a gene on at the right time in the right place to direct the formation of fingers and toes as a baby or a kitten grows in the womb. Not only that, but the switch is miles away in molecular terms from the gene it acts upon Learning about the Hemingway cats and their broken switches got me thinking about my own understanding of how our genes work and how I explain it to the public through my work as a science writer and a broadcaster. Um, I'll carry on a bit. Um, so my first brush with modern genetics came when I was at secondary school, courtesy of our formidable deputy headmaster, Mr Myers. As well as stalking the school corridors with a steely glare of stern disapproval, doling out detentions seemingly at random, he also doubled as a biology teacher. One day it was his turn to preside over the regular school assembly. We dutifully trooped into the main hall to sit cross-legged on the floor, doing our best to avoid his eye. He took to the stage, black academic gown, flowing out behind him like a cape, clasping in his hand what looked like a magazine, but must have been a scientific journal of some sort. Towering in impotent fury from the stage, he shook it at us in disapproval, as if it were a piece of pornography fished out from behind a cistern in the boys' toilets. Look at this, he thundered, slapping at the page, covered in the letters A, C, T and G, repeated in seemingly endless permutations. It's like a phone book, all these letters, 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 letters. A pause for breath. This is biology nowadays. And today we merrily talk about all sorts of things being in our genes, from a, a talent for singing to a life-threatening cancer. My mother is obsessed with family history, believing that almost every aspect of mine and my sister's characters can be traced back to one or other of our long-dead ancestors, be they Baptist preachers or depressive alcoholics. It turns out I got both. Um, thanks, Mum. Science writers enthusiastically describe the genome, that's the sum total of all an organism's DNA, as the blueprint of life, akin to a computer program or an architect's plan. The double helix has become a cultural icon, not to mention lazy advertising shorthand for, ooh, science. But while the language of genetics has infiltrated the public consciousness, 
a genuine understanding of what our genes are and what they do has not. Um, so that's basically why I wanted to write this book, because we hear about genes all the time in the newspapers or in the media. You know, we know they make our eyes brown, they make our hair curl, uh, they make us fat, they give us cancer. But how do they work? How do they do that? Um, has anyone here got a, any background in genetics? Everyone's going to put their hand up now. So you all know how genes work. So basically, I'll just get on to the stupid stuff about the cats, right? Um, so um, what I wanted to do in this book was go and talk to a whole bunch of people working in genetics, people who'd made great discoveries in the past, people are working at the frontiers of genetics now. And I went all around the world. I went to, to Europe, to the US. I Skyped people in Australia because I had, didn't have that kind of travel budget. And, um, and basically asked loads of them to explain, you know, what have you done? What are your, what's your work? And then also, what's weird? What makes you think, you know, go home evolution, you're drunk? Uh, because I thought that would be very enlightening about where the futures are, where the sort of the, what's on the fringe now that's going to become the pioneering frontier of genetics in the future. And so I covered a lot of ground in this book, uh, starting from the, what really came out of the human genome sequence, the discovery that you know, we thought we were going to have about 100,000 genes when we sequenced the human genome. So we, this was uh, back in 2001. And there was actually a sweepstake that was, that was held at the time when they started sequencing the human genome about how many genes there would be in there. And I remember, because I was doing my PhD at the time, and, they, you know, there was this figure bandied around about, like, it's going to be about 100,000 genes, right? It's about 100,000 genes. That was based really on just, like, you know, I don't know. Um, and people who knew a lot about genetics said, no way. There's no way that it's 100,000 genes. It's going to be less. Uh, but no one listened to them. And, uh, and there was a sweepstake held by uh, some people at a conference, and you could bet on it, and all these scientists bet on it. Um, and in the end, the winner, I think, was uh, someone who bet about like 24,000 genes. And in fact, when the human genome was published, it turned out to be about 22,000 genes, but actually that's come down. Uh, the number of genes that we think we have has actually dropped because some of them are clearly just fake genes or rubbish or not really genes at all. So that was surprising. Because that basically puts us on a par with nematode worms and fruit flies. And there was this idea that we were going to be really sophisticated and have loads and loads of genes, because we're kind of cool. I mean, humans are like the pinnacle of creation or whatever. Um, but no, it turns out we don't have that many genes at all. Wheat has 100,000 genes. Plants have loads, loads and loads of genes. A water flea has 35,000 genes. You know, we are nothing. <laughs> in terms of how many genes we have. Uh, but we use them in wonderful and very creative ways. And I sort of explore some of the ways in the book that we get a lot more bang for our genetic buck. You know, we use uh, multiple different ways of chopping up our genes and, uh, and using them in interesting capacities. And so that was a surprise. Uh, the other surprise was that our genes, actual honest-to-God genes, only makes up less than 2% of the entire genome. So again, that was a bit of a surprise. And people had had this inkling for quite some time that the genome was really not made of that many genes. Uh, and what's the rest? I mean, everyone's like, oh, it's just junk DNA, isn't it? Which is a crap phrase, and we should never use it. Um, but the phrase junk DNA, that's, I mean, that, that it became prominent in the 70s. So there was a Korean researcher called Susumu Ono who published a paper entitled So Much Junk in Our Genomes. And this was around about the time they just started sequencing, uh, reading bacterial genomes, you know, working out what bits are genes, how big genomes are, how much DNA is in an organism's genome. And so they knew bacteria had like, uh, you know, really simple bacteria that live in your gut for a want of demonstration, you know, they have this much DNA and they have like a couple of thousand genes. Now humans have like hundreds and hundreds of times that amount of DNA. You can weigh it practically. Uh, 
And then his idea was, well, look, we can't have, like, 500,000 genes. That's nonsense. And then there are other organisms that have even more DNA than we do, like physical DNA in their cells. Something like a salamander is like, you know, a million genes or something. And he's like, that's ridiculous. What, what does a salamander need with all those genes? Come on. So he figured out that there was probably not that many genes in your average genome, but that the rest of it was stuff. No, no one really knew. So this phrase, junk DNA, came around. Um, there's some good evidence it was actually being used in the 60s by people like Crick in Cambridge, out of Watson and Crick. Um, but it became this sort of common parlance that you've got the genes and then you've got the junk. And we're only really just starting to unpick what's in that junk. And this is very controversial because uh, there was a study published in 2012, a big study called ENCODE, where they started rifling through all this stuff, the non-coding genome, the non-genes bit of the genome. And, um, and they basically said, you know, uh, judging by what we think, whether we can find, you know, stuff stuck to this bit of DNA or that stuff's being, like, read off this bit of DNA, 80% of the genome does something. And they're like, wow! Because this project costs, like, millions and millions and millions of pounds. Uh, so they had to prove that it was, like, big uh, and that it did loads of stuff. And, um, <laughs> uh, and then people who actually knew about genetics and how genomes work turned around and went, no, that's crap. Uh, because, for example, a, a good example is just because something is stuck there doesn't mean that it's actually doing anything. Right? So if you walk into an office and you see someone working away on a computer, they could be doing a spreadsheet or something, or they could just be on Facebook. So like one of those things is functional and one of those things is not actually functional. Um, the same thing as with chewing gum, you know, you, you walk around, you pick up some chewing gum on your shoe. That doesn't mean like the function of chewing gum is to stick to your shoe, it's just that you walked through it at the wrong time. So um, the people who published this stuff, they, they've sort of recounted a bit and they've said, oh, may, well, maybe not 80% of the genome's functional, or maybe, I don't know, like uh, 50? We'll go with 50. All right, 50% 50 of the genome actually does something. 50% is functional and the other 50% is just junk, does nothing, is crap, is garbage, is just, who knows, whatever, it's stuff. Um, it's still highly contentious and there are people publishing papers that say it's less than 10% that's functional. People have really big fights about this, it's great. Um, so basically we just don't know how much of our genome is functional and if anything, what it actually does. But we do know that some of the contents of our DNA. So we know that about 2% is actual genes. We know that, I don't know, maybe 5 to 10% if that is the reg what we call regulatory elements. These are effectively control switches that turn genes on and off in the right time and the right place to build you in the womb, to build your body, to build your brain and to basically turn your genes on and off in your life as you need to do stuff. So I'll sort of introduce a concept here that some of you may be familiar with, some of you may not, but all the cells in your body, more or less, contain the same set of DNA. So you start life as one single cell with one set of DNA when mummy and daddy love each other very much. Um, you know, it's, it's a sperm and an egg, two halves of the set of DNA, they come together and they make you one egg one set of DNA, and that divides and divides and divides and divides and becomes a little ball of cells and it becomes sort of a football thing with a tiny blob of stem cells and that's going to be you one day. Uh, and those cells keep dividing and specialising and they become top and bottom and they become inside and outside and they become brain and skull and like guts and liver and all this kind of thing. But they're all doing it from the same instructions. And if you stop and think about it a little bit, you have to think, well, if all cells have the same genes, why don't all cells look the same? Why aren't we just some like horrific blob like of putty? 
Uh, but we have all this specialised tissue. We have liver cells and skin cells and brain cells and bone cells and all these kind of things. And it's because in these different tissues, different genes get turned on and off, depending on what's needed. And it's these control switches in the genome that do that. And this brings us to the Hemingway cats, because the Hemingway cats have a fault in the control switch that turns on a gene called Sonic Hedgehog. Hands up if you heard of Sonic Hedgehog. Best known gene ever. Um, it is named after the cartoon character. And there's this lovely story about the, the lab that discovered it. It was named, one of the postdocs named it because uh, he was looking at his daughter's kind of cartoon books and he saw this Sonic Hedgehog. And it's named after a fruit fly gene called Hedgehog. It's the human version, mouse version. And uh, the professor wasn't really aware of video games. Uh, but he was so stunned that their new gene was so famous that McDonald's were making Happy Meals based <laughs> on their new gene. Uh, they thought that was great. Anyway, so the, the kind of the story, I got interested in the whole writing the whole book from the idea of the Hemingway cats. And um, I went up to see Bob Hill, who's the researcher who I first heard talking about them. And the Hemingway cats are cool. I mean, I love Ernest Hemingway. I mean, I'm, I'm a writer and a drunk, so I love Ernest Hemingway for those things. Um, but also as a biologist, the Hemingway cats are really interesting because they have this extra thumb, they're thumb cats. And the story goes, so they're, they're all over Ernest Hemingway's estate in Florida Keys. And, um, and the story goes that an old sea captain gave Hemingway this cat, Snowball, possibly Snow White, the legend is sketchy, um, and uh, gave him this six-toed cat. And you find these six-toed cats all up the eastern seaboard of the US because they were very, very popular on ships. Now, there's, there's three reasons I can think of why a cat with thumbs would be popular on a ship. The first one is that the, uh, there was the idea that they were uh, better mousers. So they've got, like, you know, bigger paws. So they could catch mice more easily on the ships. Um, the other idea is that maybe they could, like, grab onto things if the ship was tipping around. Uh, grab onto a rope and not go overboard. Those are both quite tenuous. Um, I think the main reason that these six-toed cats persisted on ships is that sailors are really superstitious. <laughs> and like, what's more lucky than a cat with five toes, right? <laughs> a cat with six toes. Um, so they persisted, and, and you find them all up the eastern seaboard, and they have exactly the same genetic mutation in a control switch that turns on Sonic Hedgehog in the developing limb. It turns it on in that kind of a in that fleshy bit down at the bottom of the bottom of the hand. And it's the same in um, mice, in humans, in cats. Uh, and Sonic Hedgehog is used all over the body. It's a gene that sort of helps cells make decisions about things. So it's involved in the brain. Are you going to be a brain cell or a supporting cell? Um, it's used in deciding which bits of your guts are going to be which bits. Um, and it helps you to decide where to make fingers. And the mutation in the Hemingway cats and also in some polydactyl humans, humans with extra fingers, um, basically it, 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 it's gone wrong, it's overactive. And so the developing paws, hands, whatever, whatever cat paws are, cat paws, cat fingers, they don't know when to stop making fingers. So they just make loads of extra fingers or extra thumbs. Um, so that's kind of quite a nice example of how quite a small fault in a control switch has quite a big impact on the, what an organism looks like. You know, you go from a normal cat to a cat with thumbs. Maybe one day they will learn to pick locks and load weapons and kill us as we sleep. I don't like cats. The irony now, everyone keeps buying me stuff with cats on. Because <laughs> I've written a book about cats and I'm called Cat Fallow. <laughs> Next book about dogs. Um, but yeah, so this was the idea that, that, uh, that these control switches are actually evolution's playground. So a, a fault in a switch can give you a cat with thumbs. Um, but actually I started looking into some other examples of where changes in these control switches have had really quite dramatic impacts on an organism, an organism's physiology, an organism's appearance. And uh, there's quite a nice story. This is work done by David Kingsley at uh, Stanford University in California. And what he's done is he's looking at sticklebacks. 
Sticklebacks are little fish, mostly live in the sea, they've got like spines, stuff like that. And um, at the end of the last ice age, about 10,000 years ago, so sticklebacks, they normally live in the sea, but when they feel like, you know, frisky, uh, they go up into freshwater lakes to do it with the other sticklebacks, and then they come back down again. Now, the, the last ice age caught some of them out, and that they'd gone up into the freshwater lakes to do their filthy stickleback sex thing, uh, and they got stuck. They couldn't get back down again, and they became evolutionarily separated. So this is kind of a speciation event, basically. You separate two populations, they can't get back together again, they can't carry on breeding together. And this is about 10,000 years ago, so this is not very long in evolutionary, in evolutionary terms. Um, and what was really interesting that, that David Kingsley noticed was that all the sticklebacks that are in the sea, the marine sticklebacks, they have these like spiky fins that come out of their pelvis. And it's to help them evade predators, like kind of thing. Um, so they have these big spikes on their pelvises. In all the freshwater species that live up in the lakes that don't have predators, so there's, there's not very many predators up there, it's a much safer environment, no spikes. No spikes. They don't have spikes. And this is interesting, and you think, well, you know, from what we learn about evolution at school, evolution proceeds very slowly, you know, maybe the spikes just got smaller and smaller over time. In the same way, you know, a giraffe's neck gets slightly longer or things get slightly bigger or smaller. You know, evolution is, proceeds in these kind of creeping changes. Uh, so he x-rayed these fish and discovered that uh, the sticklebacks that live in the freshwater lakes, not only do they not have spikes, they've got no pelvis either. There's just this massive gap in the skeleton of these fish. So that's not a small change that these things have just got a bit smaller and become vestigial in the way that, like, we've lost our tails. Their entire pelvis is gone. It's like waking up and find your bum is missing. This is really fundamental change. And so he started looking at the DNA of the sticklebacks. And, and this, again, is, it's over 10,000 years. It's like nothing. And what he found is that in all the sticklebacks that were living up in the, uh, in the lakes... Uh, well, okay, so I'll uh, rewind. So what he found is that the gene responsible for basically building pelvises in sticklebacks is a gene called PIPX1. Um, that doesn't stand for pelvis anything, it stands for pituitary. It's also involved in making the jaws and the mouth, and in, in mice it's involved in like uh, limb development and the pituitary gland. Um, and he discovered that both the fish, they have this gene, PIPX1, and in both the marine fish and freshwater fish, this gene is switched on in the, in the front end of the fish, in their jaws, in their mouth, where it's meant to be. But in the freshwater sticklebacks, it's not turned on in the area where their pelvis is going to grow, whereas it is in the marine fish. And the difference is a tiny, tiny region of DNA, the control switch that turns it on when the stickleback is developing, and these fish up in the lakes, they don't make a pelvis at all because this little piece of DNA, this little instruction switch is missing. And it's, it's just incredible. It's a huge physiological change. And I've had a few people say like, well, what's, what's the advantage? Because all these fish are like this. And I'm not really sure what the advantage would be. Maybe, um, I mean, with, with evolution, it's usually like, you can either mate better, or you're faster, or you can eat more. Um, so it's going to be one of those. Maybe they swim faster, maybe it's easier for them to have sex with other sticklebacks. Um, maybe they mature quicker, who knows? Uh, but it's a really interesting story that a very small change in a control element has a really big change on the organism. And there are other examples that I started finding um, a lot more stuff from Kingsley's lab. Uh, for example, there's a single letter change in a control switch for a gene called uh, KIT-LG, which is involved in pigmentation. That's the difference between having blonde hair 
and brunette hair. It's not like sort of yes, no, on, off. It's kind of more like sort of turning the dials up and down because, you know, we don't have perfect blondes and perfect brunettes. But these alterations, they sort of change your coloration. And it's the same for skin color as well. So there's a single letter in a control switch in, uh, that controls Kitel G in the skin. And it's the difference between having quite dark skin and pale skin. And as I was writing the chapter about this, it was when the, uh, the Ferguson race riots were on last year. And I was just sitting there going like, people, it's one letter of DNA in like three billion letters of DNA. And you're just killing people for this. We are stupid, stupid species. Um, that's the philosophical bit there, anyway. Um, yeah, I, I generally I found, apart from the weird eugenicists, geneticists to be like the least racist people I know because it's like deep down we're all mutants. Uh, <laughs> everyone. Um, so that, I thought those were some really interesting examples of how very, very small changes in control switches, not genes, control switches, are having big impacts on, on how people turn out. Um, there's loads more that I could talk about, uh, the things that really surprised me. Um, and the, the book goes through the whole panoply of how our genes work, kind of starting from the very basics of how do genes get turned on and off, um, looking at these control switches, some stories about what they do and how they work, uh, lots and lots of stuff about something called RNA, which is the message that you get when our genes are read, uh, and then some of the really weird stuff about are there changes that can be passed down through generations, these things called epigenetic changes and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know if anyone wants to hear some stories about that or um, what, really. Um, but I might stop there because I feel like I've rambled for ages. Let people have a drink and then ask me some questions. Ta-da!